I'm very excited to be here at PyCon Africa uh, 2020. Um, this is my first PyCon. Um, I have given other talks at uh, various scientific Python computing conferences. Um, my name is Dr. David Pugh. I am a staff scientist at the Research Computing uh, Core Laboratory and the KAUST Visualization Core Laboratory, um, which are labs at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, which is based in Suwal, Saudi Arabia, uh, about an hour and a half drive north of Mecca, uh, just across the Red Sea from the continent of Africa, right about, um, well, I guess if I were to get on a boat and go due west, of my house, um, I would hit the border between Sudan, just to give you a rough idea of where uh, where I'm located. Um, so today, I'm going to give you uh, an introduction to a tool called Conda for managing uh, project-specific uh, virtual environments for primarily focused for uh, data science or scientific computing projects. Um, so just a few kind of preliminaries. Uh, at the very top of the chat uh, for this workshop or this session, I've placed a bunch of links. Um, one is to the uh, the course materials, the lesson materials for today. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen uh, briefly. Um, So the first link that I put in the chat um, will take you here. So these are the uh, workshop materials for today. They are online uh, on GitHub. They're always available. I'm not going to take them down or anything like that. So um, as you can see, there's, there's quite a lot of material here. Uh, we're likely to cover only um, episodes one, two, and three uh, in this two-hour session today. Uh, leaving the more advanced material in sessions four and five kind of uh, as follow-on uh, homework or continue learning as, as you wish. Uh, I particularly encourage you to take a look at uh, episode five on managing GPU dependencies. If you are doing anything with the GPU, uh, Conda can make your life a lot simpler by helping you install all the libraries that you need to work with GPUs. Uh, but I'm not going to cover that today. I'm going to focus more on uh, the basics of getting started using Conda and how to use it to manage environments and how to share environments, uh, things like this. The second link that I put in the chat takes you to the setup instructions. Now, the setup instructions um, is basically uh, all the relevant links and instructions to install uh, a Python distribution that contains the Conda tool on your local computer, whether you're using Mac or Windows or Linux. Um, all those instructions are here. Um, so hopefully you can walk through them on your own. Um, it's not required for you to install the software in order to participate in the hands-on section of this lab or this workshop. Um, at the top, I've um, placed a little button which you can click and probably right click and open it in a new tab. And if you do that, then um, you will be taken to uh, the landing page for the MyBinder service, which is this just fantastic service for taking uh, GitHub or GitLab or any kind of Git uh, repo and turning it um, into an interactive computing environment that runs on top of public cloud services. In this case, I think uh, GCP, or Google Compute Platform. So everything that you need today is already pre-installed and available, and you can run it in the cloud. So uh, no issues, no issues there. So I'm going to stop sharing for a moment and just go back to the Q&A, or to the, the chat window, and just check and see if I have any questions uh, about what is expected uh, to kind of get started. Um, oh, uh, hello, Aya. Um, I see that you've joined us now. Um, Aya, if you could, um, during the session, um, just pop in and stop me if you see a lot of uh, questions kind of building up in the chat window, uh, because once I start sharing screen for teaching, um, I won't be able to. Uh, uh, very easily see any questions as they come in. Um, 
as they come in in the chat window. So thank you ahead of time for that. Okay, so the way this is gonna work is I am going to, when I start sharing my screen, I'm gonna share the, the Jupyter Lab landing page. And then um, I am going to lecture based off of the, uh, the lecture materials, uh, the link that I, I shared with you. And then we're gonna kind of lecture for a little bit, and then there are some exercise and some hands-on components. Um, and I'm gonna type along the commands that are in the, the lecture notes as I go. And I would encourage you to do the same um, because the best way to learn how to use this tool is, is really by doing. And again, you know, you're running, you'll be running these commands uh, uh, in an, an instance that will be running in the cloud. And so there's nothing that you can do to break the, the instance or, the, or anything in any way. Um, and you can always just uh, close the tab and go back and click the link um, and get a new fresh, uh, fresh instance. So, okay. So unless I see any questions come flooding in on the chat, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Okay, cool. Uh, well, let's start sharing screen again. Okay, so here we go. Right, um, so this is an introduction to Conda for data scientists. So uh, Conda is an open source package and environment management system. It's cross-platform, so you can use it on Windows, Mac, or Linux. Um, it's going to do a lot of things that um, you might have used a tool called PIP to do. It's going to install, run, and update packages and dependencies. And then it's going to do something which PIP on its own doesn't do, which is create, save, load uh, uh, different kind of uh, virtual environments uh, for, uh, for your Python projects. So one of the cool things about Conda that differentiates it from kind of other uh, package management tools out there, and that makes it very useful for data science and scientific computing, is that Python or Conda can uh, distribute um, packages for software that is written in other languages besides just Python. Uh, this is important because a lot of scientific computing uh, builds on C and C++, Fortran, um, also uh, CUDA now any, for anything using a GPU. Um, some uh, scientific computing pipelines that are using machine learning and data science now in genomics and bioinformatics um, need Java um, or Ruby. Um, R is also very popular. So the fact that Conda can create and distribute uh, packages and software for all of these languages kind of makes it particularly useful for data scientists and for scientific computing in general. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off with uh, getting started uh, with Conda. So if you could go ahead and just click that link, I'm going to open it in a new tab. And so then these are the, the teaching materials that we're going to use for this first kind of lesson. And um, as I go through and lecture, I'm going to be typing commands into a terminal in JupyterHub. So what I want to do now um, is just make sure that everybody can see my, my screen and the text once I start typing. So if I go ahead and launch a terminal by clicking here, um, so can you read this? Okay. So now, I'm gonna to have to stop sharing just briefly and go back and just check the chat to see if everybody was able uh, to read. Font size for everybody? I'm seeing a lot of uh, yeses. Okay, cool. All right, so now I'm gonna go back and share screen. Well, I guess, has everybody, um, or has anybody managed to uh, launch Jupyter Lab? running on uh, on binder yeah okay cool 
Excellent. Awesome. All right. Yeah. So the folks at my binder are absolutely fantastic. So I, I let them know that I was going to have uh, potentially quite a few people participating in this workshop and they were able to bump my resources um, for or the number of concurrent users for uh, for my repo. So we shouldn't have any problems with uh, uh, with computing resources. So I see there's some person that needs help. Um, so hopefully I will just put the link again in the chat because hopefully there shouldn't be anything else. So Okay, so hopefully that will take you uh, where you need to go with Binder. Okay, so now we're gonna jump in. Okay, so getting started with Conda. So this first lesson is um, not quite as hands-on as most of the other lessons because it's just kind of a lot of preliminaries about you know what is Conda, what problems does it solve, why should you use it, um, but hopefully by, by the end of this, uh, this first episode, you also have some understanding of why, um, why you need a tool to manage your packages and environments, uh, and why you should make a tool like Conda as part of your, uh, data science or scientific computing, uh, workflows. And then to be able to explain some of the benefits of, of using, uh, Conda and PIP. Okay. So what is Conda? So I mentioned this briefly in the in the read-in, but I'm going to reemphasize it again. So Conda is an open source package and environment management system that runs on all major uh, operating systems. It can do a lot of things um, that you might be used to doing with Python, which is installing, running, updating packages and all their dependencies. Um, Conda can create, save, load, and switch between different uh, software environments on the same computer. So this way, if you have different projects that require different versions of Python or different versions of the key dependencies that you're used to working with, you can have um, all of those uh, different versions installed on the same machine. Just each project gets its own environment and gets its own version of Python, its own version of dependencies or whatever, whatever you need. You're not going to need to install software uh, system-wide uh, and manage, uh, manage system-wide installs anymore. And again, one of the differentiating factors of Conda uh, versus just using a tool like uh, PIP or some of the other uh, environment or package managers is that Conda can distribute software for pretty much any language. Um, R, Ruby, Lua, Scala, Java, JavaScript, C, C++, Fortran, CUDA, um, pretty much anything. Um, so Conda, you're go we're going to use Conda to solve kind of two problems, and I'm going to talk about what those problems are in just a minute. But one is package management, so it helps you find and install packages, um, and it's an, also an environment manager. Um, so it will help you um, basically set up different environments that you can install different versions of various packages into, and keep everything kind of nice and neat and tidy and organized on your on your computer. Um, when users are just getting started, a common point of confusion is that uh, once you start kind of Googling in on, on Conda and things, you're gonna run into Conda and mini Conda and Anaconda, and it's a bit, it can be a bit confusing. So this uh, kind of Venn diagram is to try to um, explain the, the differences between these things so that you won't be so confused once you start kind of Googling and trying to learn more about these tools and how to use them. So, um, at the, the biggest level is a, uh, a very popular within data science and scientific commuting uh, distribution of Python called Anaconda. Um, it's provided by a, a company of the same name, uh, but it is completely free uh, and open source. It contains uh, the mini Conda distribution, as well as um, many or several hundred, I think at this point, of the most commonly used uh, Python packages like all set up and ready to go. Now, Miniconda contains just Conda, the tool, um, plus a um, version of Python, 
and some base packages that are needed for Conda to interact with your operating system. And these things might be a little bit different depending whether you're on Windows, Mac, or Linux. Yeah. And then of course, Conda itself, Conda is just the tool. So Conda is the tool that, we, that we're gonna learn to use today. And these other two distributions, Mini Conda, which just contains Conda plus a base Python and some OS dependent system packages, and then Anaconda, which kind of contains everything. But all, both Miniconda and Anaconda include the Conda tool. So you can, I've recommended that you install Miniconda and provided instructions on the setup page for that. But if you already have Anaconda or you want to install Anaconda, you can do that as well. Okay. So just to provide a little bit of motivation about why you should use a package and environment management system uh, tool like Conda. So as it doesn't take long, you know, once you started kind of using Python um, that are just getting started with Python, even that you just have to install a lot of software and installing software is hard and tricky and it's easy to, um, it's easy to screw things up. Um, and for new users who are getting started, it can sometimes be hard to figure out what they've done wrong or how to backtrack and how to undo what they've just done. It's, it's a challenge. Installing software is just a challenge. Installing scientific software is sometimes even more challenging um, because oftentimes scientific software is written by academics and researchers, not professional software engineers. And the documentation might not be as complete. Things might not be as polished. Um, certain things about the build process might be very complicated because it involves compiling C, C++, and Fortran. Um, or other things. So science, installing scientific software is a, even more of a challenge. Um, so installing, um, installing software kind of system-wide or because, because of all these challenges, typically the solution is that people install software system-wide uh, on their computer. Um, the problem with that is that it can often be difficult to figure out exactly what software is, is really required for any like uh, project that you're working on. Because everything is just installed on your computer and you work on your project and you use stuff that's on your computer. But if you were to go and try to describe to a colleague or a research peer um, exactly what software you use to get your project to work, it might be difficult because everything is kind of installed on your computer. It could potentially have dependencies on uh, operating system libraries and, and things like that. Um, it's also sometimes very difficult to install different versions of the same package at the same time if you install everything at once onto your computer. Um, and what if your project needs different versions than the ones that you have, then maybe you have to update in order to work on uh, your new project, um, or um, then when you want to go and work on your old project, you have to downgrade your software. It's just very messy. Um, and it's easy to break software as you move from one project to another as you're installing everything system-wide, it's easy to break stuff. So rather than install system-wide, what I would like uh, to teach you to do today is to learn to have project specific software environments and use a tool like Conda to manage all of your software dependencies at the project level. So that way you can keep all of these uh, software dependencies separated, neat, tidy, and you won't have to, uh, won't have to worry about all of these problems. Okay. So I mentioned that Conda solves um, two, uh, two challenges. So one is uh, environment management. And so environment management is really what allows you to have different versions of the same software installed on one computer at the same time. Um, and you are uh, going to have you know, these multiple project specific software environments, you need a tool that allows you to create new environments, switch between different environments, maybe remove environments that you're no longer using, and just to be able to kind of keep everything nice and nice and separate. Now, 
a tool that you might have heard of or had some uh, interaction with that is kind of a very general solution to environment management is a tool like Docker. Uh, so Docker containers are kind of the, um, you know, kind of held up in some sense as the ideal solution for uh, environment management and environment uh, isolation because within a Docker container, you can have an entirely separate operating system. Like you could be running Linux inside a Docker container, but have Windows installed on your local machine or something like this. Um, but even if you're using a, a very um, uh, more general environment management solution like Docker, you still have to solve the second problem that you encounter when you're doing uh, uh, these kinds of workflows. And that's package management because inside the Docker container, um, you still have to install and manage all of your Python specific uh, software like NumPy or SciPy or um, Pandas or Matplotlib, or things like this. So you still need a package manager. And, you know, so a good tool for a package manager is, of course, going to identify and install the compatible versions of the software and all their required dependencies, um, handle the process of updating software as more recent versions become available and things like this. Um, if you use Linux, you may have experience with your operating system package managers like apt or yum. Um, on Mac, they have something called Homebrew, uh, which is an interesting project to bring something Linux-like as a package management system to Mac. Um, there's really not nothing similar that I've encountered for Windows uh, if you're a Windows user. Okay, so those are the two problems that you want to solve. So environment management and package management. And then what we're going to see today is that Conda solves both of these with a single tool. And that's what I think is kind of nice. You just learned one tool, maybe if, as we're going to also see maybe six to 10 kind of key commands to use this tool and you can automatically solve these environment package management problems. Okay. So why should you use Conda and then plus pip um, when necessary instead of uh, you know, perhaps some other solution. So one is that uh, Conda distributes pre-built packages, um, so binaries. So this is really nice because it avoids the need to deal with compilers um, or to work out exactly how to build a particular tool from source. Um, a lot of times in scientific uh, computing projects, there is a really messy build and compilation step or steps that have to be done to get uh, an executable binary that you could actually use in your project. And Conda kind of uh, goes around all of that complexity by just distributing pre-compiled binaries targeting specific hardware architectures. And then Conda will also manage installing the right binary for the hardware that you have on your local machine. Um, uh, there's a link here to an astronomy code that is uh, a good example of something that's very, very difficult to install from source. Um, TensorFlow is a tool uh, that's widely used in deep learning um, that was developed by Google. Uh, building TensorFlow from source is really, really challenging, um, but getting uh, CPU or GPU optimized binaries uh, for TensorFlow is one line when using Conda. Um, again, I mentioned cross-platform as being a good, good, um, a good reason to use Conda, so it should work on Windows, Mac, or Linux. Also, it can target different uh, hardware architectures um, if you're you know, working on something that's not uh, the x86, which is probably the most common. And it, it plays nicely with tools like PIP. So we'll see some examples today of how to, if you're already an experienced user of PIP, you can see how you can use Conda and PIP to complement one another um, to solve your environment and package management issues. Another, another nice benefit is that um, Anaconda, which uh, it maintains the Python, the Anaconda Python distribution and Miniconda and Conda uh, open source projects, um, they distribute optimized binaries for many uh, of the core packages. So things that I use Intel's math kernel libraries, or CUDA, um, you can get binaries that already have these things enabled. Uh, so they're already highly optimized and very, very performant. Okay, 
So just a reminder, so Conda is a platform agnostic, uh, open source package and environment management system. Um, using package and environment management tools like Conda, it helps facilitate uh, portability and reproducibility of your data science workflows. Um, and Conda plus PIP solves both the package and environment management system and targets multiple programming languages. So other solutions that I've come across either um, solve just package management or just environment management, um, or they target a particular programming language. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna just stop sharing briefly um, and try to t go back and take a look at the questions uh, and just see what kind of uh, da -da -da questions we have in here. Okay. Uh, thank you for pinning the link. Um, that's really useful. Don't know if I could have done that myself, uh, but thank you for whoever did that. Um, actually, there's a package manager called Scoop. I've not heard of Scoop, uh, Uzoma. Thank you for, for that. I will, uh, I will just put it in another tab to look at later. Um, and Chocolatey, I had heard about Chocolatey. Um, and I think I had a link to Chocolatey in the project or in the, the lesson materials. It didn't look like it was super de well developed last I checked. And Microsoft announced their old uh, Winget. Okay, that seems uh, Winget, something else I should take a look at. Okay, when is it better to use Conda alone or PIP alone? Um, okay, so that's a very good. Um, uh, that's a very good question. So um, that we will talk about um, kind of come up in the, the next couple episodes. So we will look at specifically like when you should use Conda alone. Um, I almost never use uh, PIP alone. So the general way that I work is Conda wherever possible and PIP only when necessary. So there are some libraries that are not have not been made available by their authors for distribution via conda and for those you have to use pip but for i would say probably 85 to 95 percent of the libraries that i use on a day in day out basis are all available via conda um, and then for that last like five to ten percent um I can get via PIP, and I'll show you how to combine the two together to, to solve those problems. Um, okay, so does Conda provide an image builder like Docker? So uh, the short answer to that question is no. Um, as you'll see, uh, Conda environments are more like uh, structured directories uh, instead, of, um, instead of images. But if you remind me later, I will provide a link to um, an article that I wrote on Medium on how to combine Conda with, um, how to basically inject a Docker environment, or sorry, inject a Conda environment inside of a Docker, uh, a Docker image and build an image and run containers based on that. And that's what I use if I want to deploy my Conda environments into the cloud. Uh, and uh, Zioden, um, uh, So I will answer that question, um, which is quite specific, once we get to uh, get to the point where we start actually creating environments. Okay, cool. So let's um, let's create some Conda environment. So now I'm going to start sharing my screen again. Share, and we will go to the next lesson. Working with environments. Okay, so um, in this uh, episode, uh, which is one of the the three kind of uh, big episodes that we're going to cover today, um, we're going to talk about the basics of Conda. So, what is a Conda environment? How do you create and delete environments? How do you activate or deactivate environments? Which is like switching between different environments. Um, how do you install packages into an existing environment? So that's kind of a key thing. Um, where should you create them? Um, as we'll see, Conda environments are like directories. So like, where should you store your directories for your Conda environment? Um, 
how do you find out what you've installed in an environment, um, how to find out what environments exist on your machine if you've created a lot of them, and how, again, deleting them uh, if you don't need it anymore. So by the end of this, all of the objectives, the objectives are basically to show you how to, to answer this question uh, using Conda. Okay. So what is a Conda environment? So a Conda environment, and there's a link there to the official documentation, is just a directory that contains a specific collection of Conda packages and, uh, and associated metadata that's install, uh, structured in a very, very specific way. Um, if you have one research project and requires NumPy 1.18, which is a very recent, very new version of NumPy, um, and you have, uh, you can install that in one environment. Um, you might have another environment um, that is associated with a project that you finished, and maybe that version of NumPy that worked that was that you used on that project is 1.12, and that's fine. You can have those environments. So you can basically have old work that has environments pinned to the versions of the dependencies that you used at the time that you were working on the project so that you can go back to it and you'll know it will always work. And then you can have another project that is kind of in development and using kind of the bleeding edge of the most recent versions uh, of the library. And you can switch back and forth between these different environments. Um, so uh, one tip is there is a, when you install, uh, uh, Anaconda or Miniconda and get the Conda tool, uh, the Conda tool sets up a base Conda environment. And that base Conda environment isolates um, uh, Conda and its own version of Python from your system Python. So you never really want to use the Python that has been installed on your system because it's there for doing operating system specific things like interacting with Windows or interacting with Mac OS or, or things like this. And it's included by the developers of the operating system specifically for the operating system to use to do stuff, not for you to do your work with. So the base Conda environment is like a level of isolation for your Python projects from system Python. Now, but you never really want to install anything into your base Conda environment. It's much better to just let that base Conda environment just have the Conda tool and the non-system Python and other stuff, and then create additional environments for each of your projects. So how do we do that? So at this point, I'm going to start typing commands. So I'm going to continue using the lectures um, uh, and lecturing based off of the, the lecture notes. But now I'm going to switch over to Jupyter Lab um, and actually start typing some uh, some code. So hopefully now uh, you can follow along with me. And I'm just going to close this. And so go back. So this is the landing page um, that you would have hit with um, once you click the link that, that I shared and takes you to Jupyter Lab. If you've not used Jupyter Lab before, um, I'll just do a kind of a quick introduction. So this big area over on the right hand side that has notebooks and consoles and other stuff like terminals, text files, uh, markdown and editor, uh, this is called the working area and the launcher. So here you can launch notebooks or Python console, terminals, other stuff. Um, over here is kind of like the uh, the file manager uh, window and we'll do some stuff uh, with the, a little bit of stuff with the file manager, but mostly we're just gonna be using the terminal today. So if you go ahead and click terminal, then you'll get a new terminal with a very long prompt. Um, and I've not quite figured out exactly the best way to shorten that prompt. So you're gonna have to bear with me on the long, the long prompt today. Um, and now to give myself a little bit more space, I'm just gonna go over here and click this folder, which will toggle the, uh, the file manager basically. So that just gives me a little bit more space. Okay, so here we go. Um, so, Let's create some environments. So let's suppose that we wanted to create an environment uh, for Python 3 development. Um, so we could do conda create. So the command for creating an environment with conda is conda create. Um, and then we have to name our, uh, our Python environment. And we'll just call it uh, Python 3 
EMV. Um, what you name your environment is kind of up to you. Uh, I would encourage you to, to try to be consistent, adopt some kind of a naming convention and be consistent um, just to, to make your life, life easier. So that you, and then I will install into this environment Python and a tool called PIP, which is the default uh, package manager. I, every uh, Conda environment I create, I always install Python, I always install PIP because I always, I always want, want this. Now, I hit enter and you'll start seeing Conda doing its thing. So Conda will uh, go off to the, uh, it will go off and gather metadata and information about the packages that is required. Um, uh, so, for example, here it's telling us a little bit of a warning, saying that there's actually a slightly newer version of Conda than what we're using. That's okay. Um, gives you some a command that you can run to update your version of Conda. Don't need to worry about that. Um, and then it gives you what's called a package plan. It's basically some uh, information about what Conda is going to do. So it's going to create an environment in a particular location. We'll talk more about how to change this later. But you can see here's the absolute path from the root of the file system inside the container in this case, down to the directory, Python 3-env, where the Python environment will be created. And then these are the packages that we wanted to install. This is the, these are the ones that we listed to install. These are all the packages that are actually will get installed. So this includes basically, so here's Python 3.8. That's the most recent version of Python that is available. PIP 20.2.1. And then all these other things are actually Linux specific dependencies or dependencies of Python or PIP and operating specific stuff that um, either Python or PIP require. So you can see here, just installing Python or PIP, you're going to need you know, two dozen uh, other libraries or packages. Conda um, has found a set of versions of all of these dependencies that are the most recent and mutually compatible uh, versions of the software. So that's kind of the package management aspect of Conda at work. It's finding all of the things that you need for the soft to support the software that you want to install, plus versions of all of these things that are mutually compatible so that it'll work nicely together. So it's going to download all of that and then install them. And it asks, do you want to proceed? Yes or no? So you type yes and hit enter. And then it's actually going to start downloading things. So during the, the uh, environment creation step, you generally are going to need an internet connection because um, Conda is going to need to download all these binaries and packages um, from online, but once they're downloaded, you don't need to have an internet connection necessarily to use them. Okay, and so that's it. So now we've created our first Python 3 environment, and there's some commands here to uh, activate and deactivate the environment. We're gonna talk about these commands in a minute, but every environment you create, Conda will always tell you, here's a command that you can run to activate the environment, and here's a command you can run to, to deactivate that environment. Okay. Now, so we've created our first environment. Um, and as I, as I said, the, if you don't specify ahead of time which versions that you want, so notice um, um, notice that when I specified Python and then pip, I didn't say anything about any particular version. So by default, Conda will find the most recent mutually compatible versions of these packages to install. That's why we got uh, Python 3.8.5 here and PIP 20.2.1. Those are the most recent versions of those packages that are available and they just happen to also be um, work together with one another. But what if we wanted to do something uh, different? So what if we actually specifically needed a version of Python, like Python 3.6? So we could go back here and we say, well, we'll create a new environment called Python 3.6. 
and then we type Python equals 3.6. And um, we can, let's say we want a specific version of pip. So let's do pip uh, 20.1, for example. So not the most recent version of pip, but a slightly older version of pip. So if you were to hit enter, then again, we're gonna get the exact same thing. So now specific versions of Python are gonna be installed, and this is the location where the environment will be installed, and then this is all the specifics about what actually is gonna be installed. So we wanna proceed, so we type Y and hit enter, and then it downloads some stuff, so you can see 3.6.11 is actually what's being installed. And there we go, so now we've got another environment with a different version of Python. We could actually do, um, should actually be able to do this with Python too. So let's suppose that you needed um, a project that only works with Python 2. So even though Python 2 is, is no longer supported, there's still a lot of legacy code around that requires Python 2. So we could do um, conda create uh, Python 2 environment and then change this to Python to uh, maybe 2.7. So let's call this Python 2.7 2 to be more specific. Python 2.7 was the last version of Python 2 that was made available, um, the last minor version at least, I think. And then pip, um, I don't actually know what the most recent version of pip that will work with Python 2 is, and so I'm just gonna leave no, ver no specific version on pip. But then if I hit enter, Conda is gonna run off and so now what it's doing is it's trying to figure out kind of what set of uh, um, uh, libraries is needed uh, to work with Python 2. And so there we go. So let's see, Python 2.7.15 and pip 20.1. So we can just hit yes and hit enter. And again, it's gonna download all of these things check that they all work properly with one another and install. Right, so uh, what we've done now within the last like 10 minutes solved an enormous problem um, over the last like five plus years as the community was transitioning between Python 2 and Python 3 and it's still a major problem. Uh, there are, there's a lot of legacy code that still only works on Python 2 and hasn't been hasn't been updated to Python 3 yet, and having the ability to have two major versions of Python that are different installed on the same machine uh, solves what had pretty much been a, a, a very difficult problem. Um, so now you know how to install Python 2 and Python 3 or any versions of Python that you want. Okay, now um, I've, personally would recommend that you always specify specific versions um, of your packages when you install them into an environment. This just helps keep your life simpler um, and you always know exactly what uh, versions that you're using in each of your, in each of your environments. All right, so we're gonna do uh, a couple more examples and then we're gonna, there's gonna be an exercise and I'm gonna switch back and, and start taking questions. Um, that you post in the chat uh, in the chat window. So I haven't forgotten about you if you have a question languishing in the in the chat menu. Um, okay, so I said it's very important to specify version numbers, but then what if you don't know what version is available or what is even the most recent version of a package you wanna work with? Well, there's another handy command called conda search. And conda search will allow you to search for a particular package that you might want to install. So let's try scikit-learn. So scikit-learn is a very popular um, machine learning library, very widely used uh, uh, both in research and it's available via Conda. So if we do Conda search scikit-learn, then we'll see a complete list 
of all the different versions of scikit-learn that are available. So the last version is 0 0.17, and the most recent version is 0 0.23. So there's probably two to three years worth of versions of scikit-learn available via, uh, via Conda. Okay. And there are quite a few options that you can do in terms of pattern matching and wildcard searches and things like that with Conda search, but you can type Conda search help and hit enter to get a, um, a help menu that kind of explains what you can, the different options that you can use, um, the syntax for using the command and some examples at the bottom. So there's some wildcard examples. Uh, for uh, for searching and pattern matching. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to type the clear command just to clear out the uh, the history or the, not the history, the screen. Um, so let's try another example. So what if we wanted to create um, an environment for like a kind of a base environment for scientific computing? So we might call that base scipy uh, environment. Um, and into this environment, we're going to install um, IPython, uh, which is an interactive version of the Python uh, interpreter, uh, which has been around for quite a long time now. Uh, and we'll install version 7.13. Not sure that's the most recent version that's available. We're going to install matplotlib, which is a, uh, a plotting and visualization package uh, that has uh, it's one of the kind of default packages widely used in scientific computing. Um, NumPy, uh, so NumPy is a package for um, manipulating n-dimensional arrays of numbers. So it, again, is one of the foundational packages in the scientific computing uh, Python ecosystem. We'll do pip uh, and 20.1, and then scipy, 1.4. So the combination of NumPy and SciPy are basically Python ecosystem replacements for MATLAB and the MATLAB toolkit. Um, so if you've ever used, if you use MATLAB and haven't come across, um, you know, Python alternatives, so now these are the alternatives, NumPy and SciPy um, cover 95% of what you can do uh, in MATLAB. Um, uh, and there's even another uh, package called SimPy, uh, which I didn't put in my lecture notes that you can install that is symbolic algebra uh, uh, similar to Mathematica, although not quite as fully featured as Mathematica. So let's go ahead and hit enter. And this might take a little bit longer. We're asking to install a few more things. Um, So in the background, what's going on when it says solving the environment? So Conda uh, sets up a mathematical problem uh, called a satisfiability problem, where it takes the packages that you want to install and constraints, any constraints on the version numbers, and then sets up a, a kind of a set of logical equations that it can then solve to figure out what is the most current, mutually consistent set of packages to install. And sometimes that can take a little bit um, if the number of packages that need to be checked is large. Uh, so we'll just hit yes. And while this is just downloading some stuff, uh, we can go up here and just take a look at what has been uh, installed. Um, if there's anything interesting or worth pointing out. So, so here, this libblast, libcblast, these things, these are the linear algebra um, packages that uh, NumPy uses. These are written in um, C, C++, or Fortran, so they're very, very fast. Um, and, but you, won't, you don't need to know or use C, C++, or Fortran in order to make use of them, because NumPy allows you to use them from within Python. Um, uh, not sure there's anything else of, of note in there present. Um, so there's SimPy 1.6. So that was the version uh, that I didn't know. 
So now it's downloaded everything, and now it's just checking that everything matches um, as expected, and now it's actually installing things, which is basically populating the contents of the directory that is here. So this directory has been created, and when the transaction starts executing, files are actually being installed um, in particular locations within this directory. And we're done. Okay. And uh, just to show you that we, that we were done, so I'll talk about how uh, activating more specifically in a moment, but if we were to do conda activate uh, basic SciPy environment, and then once we have that environment activated, we can go and type uh, Python to drop into a Python uh, interpreter. So we're using Python 3.8.5. Uh, and then if I was to try to import something that I just installed, I could do import numpy as mp, and we're good to go. Or um, from scipy import optimize, which would be imp importing the optimization toolkit from SciPy. So we could do that. Um, what else did we install? Um, to import the plotting library, the library, you can have import uh, matplotlib uh, uh, dot pyplot as plot, as plot. So these are like the standard imports for for these kinds of libraries. So that's just to show you that it actually worked as I, I said that it did. Um, and then we can exit. And then again, I'll talk about deactivation and activation in a minute. Okay, so there's an exercise for you guys to work on on your own um, for the, the next few minutes. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then go back and start looking for questions that I can answer. And in the meantime, if you can take a look at the creating a new environment, it's just walking you through, again, the steps that we've done to create these environments, but creating a new environment called machine learning uh, in, uh, that has Python and then IPython, Matplotlib, Pandas, and Scikit-Learn. So if you would just go and install uh, or create a new environment and see how you get on with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and go back and see what kind of questions have accumulated. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna scroll back up here. And, right. So there's a question about, uh, I always use Conda for packages installation. I once had an issue in, that used Zookeeper after I had installed it with Conda, and I solved it by deactivating Conda. Um, so that is a good question. Zookeeper is, that's from like the, um, is that the tool from the kind of the big data Java ecosystem, uh, like Hadoop, Spark, uh, that kind of thing. Zookeeper is, does something in that ecosystem. I don't really know what causes it. It's interesting that it's installed, that you can install it via Conda though. Um, I'm not sure I would have thought to do that. Um, yeah, so Zayden, it is kind of like creating little separate containers um, in that each directory can be thought of as a, an, it's an, an isolated container-like thing. Yeah. Uh, so that's a good way to think about it. Right, so uh, Joseph, so if you installed Conda and installed so many packages for me without giving me controls to decide which libraries I wanted to install, so you may have installed the Anaconda Python distribution, which includes Conda plus about 300 other packages um, and libraries. So I 
I recommend that people install mini Conda because that just brings Conda plus its own uh, Python, and that's pretty much it. And so that way you have complete control over exactly what's installed and you only install the things that you need. Um, so do different environments set up by Conda in the same machine share the CPU resources like a Docker container? So yes, so all you're doing is creating a directory with, um, with software installed in that directory and then Conda basically makes sure that when you activate an environment, as we'll talk about in a minute, um, it will use everything that you've installed inside that directory and not some other versions that might exist on, on your machine. But everyone, all, all Conda environments are going to be using and will be limited by the hardware resources um, on the machine on which they're installed. So CPU, memory, uh, GPU availability, things like that. Uh, PIP has two versions of 20.1.1 for build Pi 3.7 and build Pi 3.8. So how, how would it identify? Well, it depends on what version of Python that you specified. So if you specified version Python 3.7, it would pick up PIP 20.1.1 for Python 3.7. If you didn't specify uh, your Python version, it would pick up Python 3.8 because that's the most recent version of Python, and then it would pick up the pip version for Python 3.8, if that makes sense. Uh-oh, audio video issues. Um, hopefully, I say hopefully it's just issues on, on your end and that there will be a good solid recording um, of both audio and video that will be available later um, if you are having issues on your end, but I have, uh, when I have had them, I have refreshed, and that has helped solve the problem. Okay, what is the difference between PIP and Conda? Um, okay, so this is an important question. We're going to come back uh, to it um, a little bit more later. But um, so PIP is the default Python package uh, management solution. Um, it's part of the Python uh, standard library, I believe, and it's just um, kind of the default solution. So PIP. Um, doesn't do environment management, so you have to use another uh, uh, another tool. I believe it's called pip env together with pip to get environment management and package management. Um, so that's one difference between pip and conda. Pip um, manages packages for only for Python. So for more complicated projects or workflows where you need um, not just Python dependencies but dependencies from other languages, possibly even Java. Um, or C, C++, or Fortran, or CUDA, Conda can handle those cases as well, whereas PIP, uh, PIP cannot. Um, however, there are, uh, there are uh, instances where Conda um, will not be able to install a package by itself because that package has not been made available for distribution via Conda, in which case you can use Conda to install PIP and then PIP to install those, uh, those dependencies. That's why I always install pip in all of my Conda environments because at some point there, I might need a package for that environment, that project, that isn't available via Conda. And then I'll just use pip. Okay, so that's the end of the chat. Um, hopefully that's given you enough time to kind of go over that, uh, uh, the creation of that environment. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my, uh, my screen again. And we'll just kind of pick up where I left off. Um, working with environments. Okay. So um, all of the exercises that are in these lesson materials have solutions. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over this uh, this exercise uh, together. But if you click the little uh, this arrow, it toggles the uh, the solution. And you can see, again, it's using that conda create command um, with a particular name, and then I'm just listing off the things that I want to install. And I can put particular versions to those things if I want particular versions. Okay, so environment activation. So um, once you create environments, of course, you have to activate it. And activating and deactivating is how we switch between different conda environments that are installed on the same machine. 
So activation does a couple of things. So first off, it adds entries to your system path variable for that environment. So that your system path variable is how your operating system figures out um, how to load uh, libraries and software that's installed on your computer. It starts on the, the first entry in the path and it kind of goes through the different directories, which are entries in your path, until it finds the executable that it's looking for or it throws an error if it can't find it in any of the entries in the path. So when you activate a conda environment, the absolute path to that conda environment is uh, prepended to your system path. So your computer will always look in that environment first for any software uh, that, that you want to use. And then uh, the second thing that activation does is it runs any activation scripts that the authors would have put um, uh, as part of the package installation process uh, with conda. This is mostly used, I guess, in scientific computing, data science applications where certain environment variables need to be set or configured a certain way. Um, those scripts will be run, which will configure the environment variables appropriately when you activate the environment. Okay. Um, so we can activate environments. I'll go back over to JupyterLab now. So we can activate environments by using the conda activate command. So um, the conda uh, activate, and then you need to provide uh, the name or the path to the environment that you want to activate. So if we want to activate the basic uh, SciPy environment, we just do conda activate and then basic SciPy environment and hit enter. And then notice that on the prompt, you always get an indication, or you will typically get um, an indication of which environment that you're using. You'll have the name of the environment or the path to the environment will show up in uh, in parentheses at the start of the prompt. Okay, so that's environment activation. If you want to deactivate, uh, you just type conda deactivate. And so now we've deactivated, and now we're in this environment called Notebook. And you might think like, well, what is this Notebook environment? Excuse me, I didn't create this this environment. Yeah, so that's one, that's a, a default environment that is uh, created by uh, Binder when we launched, um, when you launched this instance uh, in the cloud. It's just part of the, uh, the internals of the Binder tool. Um, we can deactivate that environment if we wanted by doing conda deactivate. Yep, and so now we no longer have any environment activated. And that's okay. If we want to activate the base environment, you can just type uh, conda activate and you'll get the base environment. So this is the base environment that I was talking about um, before. Now I'm just going to type clear just to get some more, more space to work with. Um, there's some activation, deactivation environment uh, exercises that are, are there for you. I'm going to skip those in the interest of time, but you can play around with, with them as you, as you wish. Okay, so the environments that we've created thus far, we've focused on kind of listing the things that we want to install when we create the environment itself. But what if we, I don't know, what if we forget a package that we actually want? How do we install a package that we into an existing environment? Um, or what if we just don't know actually what, what we want other than Python and pip, and then we're gonna figure it out as we go along. Um, so for that, you need to know how to install a package into an existing environment. So let, let's see how we might do that. So first we're going to um, conda activate uh, basic SciPy environment. So we're gonna activate our basic SciPy environment. Um, and now let's install another package. Um, in particular, we're going to install a package called Numba. Um, so for those of you who might be unfamiliar with Numba, so Numba is a really cool project for doing uh, what's called just-in-time compiling of uh, Python. So it takes pure Python code and then compiles it down into um, 
very, very uh, efficient, um, optimized machine code. At, and that optimized machine code is then used at runtime. So there are many ways you can use it. You can actually compile it to target different architectures. Um, you can compile stuff to run on GPUs and other optimized CPUs. Um, it is quickly becoming kind of one of the, another foundational tool in the scientific uh, Python and data science machine learning Python uh, ecosystems. So you might want to install it at some point. So if we wanted to install Numba into this environment, we could do conda after we've activated the environment. This is important. You need to activate the environment first. And then if you want to install Numba, you just do conda install Numba. And this will go off and figure out, okay, you want to install Numba. Well, what are the dependencies of Numba? You need to go and find those. And you need to find uh, versions of Numba as well as the dependencies of Numba that are consistent with the other packages that are already installed in the environment. So that Conda has to figure that out. So we just hit yes. And um, there we're done. That didn't take long. So now, uh, now we have Numba. Um, what else? So we could try another example. So if we want to install scikit-learn, so we didn't have scikit-learn before, we could do uh, conda install scikit-learn. And this is going to install scikit-learn into our existing environment. And if we wanted to, again, pick a particular version, we could do 0 0.22 or something. We just specify, use equals, and then the, the version number. And so you'll see that there is a warning here. It says failed with initial frozen solve, retrying with flexible solve. Now, what that means is that when Conda, um, when you install a package uh, into an existing environment, Conda will try to keep all of the uh, existing packages frozen at their current version and simply try to install the version of scikit-learn that you want in this case, into that environment. However, if that particular version of scikit-learn will um, requires maybe a uh, a newer or slightly different version of a package um, than the one that you have in your environment, um, Conda will then retry with what's called a flexible solve, in which case it, it's updating existing packages in the environment so that you can then install scikit-learn. And apparently there was something in the environment that was needed a newer version um, or maybe an older version um, to install scikit-learn 0.22. But in the end, we were able to get everything working and we're gonna install. Okay. Okay, that's it. And so now we have scikit-learn is uh, is installed. Um, I, so now there's a couple of more exercises here on um, installing a package into a specific environment. So there's a, a, a really cool uh, package called Dask. Um, which is for uh, parallelizing and scaling up on uh, one machine or out to many machines, um, data science and machine learning uh, or scientific computing uh, workflows, data analytics and things like this. Um, really, really cool project that I use uh, quite often in my, in my work at KAUST. Um, so that first exercise is about installing Dask into the machine learning environment that you created in the previous exercise. Um, and then um, there's another exercise uh, which is installing packages into a content environment using pip. And, um, and that one uh, we'll do together. So I'll show you a, a specific example of that. Um, 
Uh, and in fact, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and then I'm going to go back and see if there's any questions in the chat, um, and I'll give you some time to work on those two, uh, these two exercises here. So installing Dask, and then uh, installing uh, a package using pip inside of a Conda environment. OK. And just a moment, I, as I'm going back, I realize I need to create a machine learning environment. So I'm going to create that really quickly. Um, and then I will And then I will come and do uh, Q&A while you guys are working on this uh, exercise. Okay, uh, Godlifer, can we have access with the materials used in this session? So yes, so the materials uh, are online at the links provided and always available. Um, maybe, um, maybe the link to the lesson materials can be pinned in the chat um, together with the link to Binder. Um, the Binder service is also always available. So as long as you have an internet connection, if you don't want to install anything, you just want to come back and 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 use the the binder service. You can use that; it's free and and available as well. Um, Joseph, great question. So, when you use pip, does it install into the virtual environment you created with Conda? Uh, and the answer is partially given in that follow up comment by uh, uh, Engel. Um, it depends. So the reason that I always install pip into every virtual environment that I have is because that way I know that when I use pip, it will use the pip that is installed in that virtual environment to install packages into that same virtual environment. This is a bit tricky because um, many operating systems already have Python and pip installed. And so if you didn't install pip into your virtual, into your conda environment, um, but PIP already existed unbeknownst to you on your, your computer already, and you activated a con environment and started typing PIP install, that PIP would be the system PIP, which m might install your packages not into the virtual environment, the con environment that you intend, but somewhere else entirely. And that still might, might work in some sense. Um, but probably not, and if it doesn't, it's gonna give weird error messages. So definitely always want to install pip in your conda environment, and we'll see an, ex an example of that in the second exercise. And Vince also had a, um, another way to use pip um, by first using the Python to call the module pip and install a particular library. And so that, um, that is one way, if you're not sure, to guarantee that you will get um, the right pip um, because you will use the Python from the environment itself. Uh, do you run Dask on a cluster on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, so we have, at Calst, we have, um, a, what we call uh, IBEX, which is our commodity cluster. Um, and it ha it's very similar in terms of its hardware spec that you would find um, on AWS or Google. Um, obviously not in volume, but in, uh, um, in terms of the individual node characteristics. 
Um, and we do have users that run Dask um, on that cluster as part of their job. Um, uh, Jean, uh, can Conda update packages installed with pip? Um, so yes, um, yes. So once you've uh, once you have installed a library via pip, these are all good questions, by the way. Um, Conda will have a record of what's installed in that environment, and then if you go and use Conda to update a package, it will know what version has been installed by pip, and it will update it to some more recent version if uh, um, if need be. Okay, cool. So that's the end of the, the questions I have there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start sharing again. Uh, share screen. And I'm going to go back to the lecture notes. And I'm going to skip this. Um, um, well, no, I won't skip. I'll, we'll just do both of them. They're, so uh, I need to do a conda deactivate and then a conda activate uh, machine learning environment. Okay. And now that I have activated my machine learning environment, I wanted to use conda to install Dask. So I'll just do conda install Dask. Okay, and you'll see Dask has quite a lot of uh, a lot of dependencies. Um, okay, so that's all done, and so now I want to use pip um, to install. Yeah, um, to install a package called Combo, I think. Combo is a um, I have a link to uh, Combo. There's a link to Combo in the, the lecture notes. Um, Combo is a really cool uh, little package for solving what's called ensemble learning problems. So it's a way of approaching machine learning, uh, a machine learning problem where instead of using one model, you might use, I don't know, six or 12 different models and then average the predictions of those several models together to obtain like a meta model which might be better than any of the individual models. So that's called creating an ensemble of models and using the ensemble to make a prediction. Combo is a really cool tool for doing that, for helping make that easy, more done more easily using scikit-learn. But it's not available via Conda, or at least it wasn't when I checked most recently. So if you want to see, so we're going to install that via pip. I ran this command which uh, pip, and which is a, a Linux or Unix command for telling you like where the where is the particular executable in this case pip, and you can see that the path to the pip executable is actually goes into the machine learning environment and into the bin directory. So that's how you can convince yourself that the pip that you're going to use when you type pip install is actually in the active environment. So if we type pip install combo. Um, so you'll see in the logs, so these are all the pip, pip logs, and it had to install a few things. Um, um, in particular, it had to install number and numbers dependencies because number, although we installed it, we did install number, but if you remember, we installed it into the basic SciPy environment, not into the machine learning environment. So pip has now installed uh, number for us and, and then combo. Okay. Um, so now uh, there's another command which we need to learn about. Well, how do we know what's been installed inside of a conda environment? There's a command called, uh, well, first we can run conda dash dash help to see what other commands are available. And then here's an interesting one. So list, list packages in a conda environment. So if we run conda list, it's going to list packages. Um, by default, the package is installed in the current active environment. So if I run conda list, now I'm going to get a complete specification of everything that's installed 
in this environment. In particular, what did we install? So we install where's combo. So they're in alphabetical order. So you can go up here and find combo. And you can see that version 0.1.1 was installed. These numbers in the third column are called the build numbers. We don't need to um, bother with those at, at present. And then in the last column, you can see like where was this installed from. And we can see that it was installed from PyPI. So everything that you install from PIP will come from the Python package index PyPI. Okay, so there you go. Um, okay. So the next thing that I want to cover is, um, so we've seen how to activate or how to create environments. We've seen how to activate and uh, deactivate environments. Um, now I want to talk about where Conda environments live and how you can change the location if you want to install them somewhere else. Um, right, so how do I specify, or how do I find out where Conda environments live? Okay, so if you install, um, uh, if you install uh, Miniconda or Anaconda locally, then your Conda environments are going to live um, in a specific subdirectory inside your home directory. So if you install Anaconda or Anaconda or Miniconda, it will always install in user home, or not, typically will install in user home by default. So like, so something like slash users, your username, and then it will be Miniconda or Anaconda 3. And then within that, there's a directory called ENVS. And, and within that directory is where all your Conda environments will go. Um, and we've seen that a little bit in the package plans as we've been creating these environments. Um, in the package plans, they always tell you the absolute path to the environment, to the directory where the environment will be created. Um, it's a little bit different just because of the way that they've been, Conda has been installed um, in the Docker image um, that is used to build the containers that we're running in at present in the cloud. So it's in a different location. So it's just slash SRV slash Conda slash EMVS. So, for example, if we were to run the command um, ls, which lists, it's a Unix command for listing the contents of a directory in uh, SRV slash uh, conda slash EMVF, you'll see here, here are all of these environments that are created. So here's our Python 3, Python 3.6, um, notebook was, um, uh, notebook was one that was created by the binder team, and then basic SciPy and machine learning and Python 2.7. So that's that's where they live. So what if you want to change the location? So how would you do that? Um, well, one way uh, that we can do that would be um, to per when we create the environment, you can pass a path to a directory rather than a name. So uh, I'm um, first I'm going to go over here and so inside the home directory if we run um, ls you'll see inside this directory uh, there are two directories binder and introduction to conda so I'm just going to cd into introduction to conda um, so that we're in uh, this introduction to conda directory just to keep everything neat and, uh, neat and tidy. So now if we create, uh, if we did conda create, um, and now instead of passing a name, we're gonna pass a prefix, which is basically a path to a directory where we want to create the environment. And so we're gonna pass as our prefix um, dot slash env. Um, dot in Unix is shorthand notation for the current working directory. So another way we could do it would be to use an environment variable, pwd for the uh, print working directory. Um, and then we're going to list off some packages. So let's do ipython, um, matplotlib, 
pandas, uh, Python. Uh, that's good enough. Okay. And now we hit enter. So now we're just creating an environment. Again, it's going through the same mechanics as before. But now if we go here and we look at the environment location, we're actually creating this environment not in the default location, but in a, a directory called env that is inside the current working directory. And as we're going to see, so this is going to be a best practice that I would encourage you to follow. So if you have a new project, that project is going to exist in its own directory somewhere. And then within that direct the project directory, you can create your conda environment in a directory called env. I always do that. Um, so that means I basically run the same conda create command over and over and over. Conda create dash dash prefix dot slash env, and then the stuff that I want to install. Okay, so that's that's that. Now, if we want to activate the environment, instead of, we don't have a name, um, we have to pass the path. So here's the path. So we can just type uh, uh, dot slash env if we want. Yeah, and so now our prompt is like, massively long um, and make it a little bit less long um, but there you go so now we have environment that's active this super long prompt and then uh, well now we've activated this environment okay so let's uh, deactivate so conda deactivate Okay, so that's how um, that's how you can change the location. Um, just a a note on naming conventions for your um, for the prefix of your environment. Um, I always use slash env as the subdirectory of my uh, of my um, project for my conda environment, and the reason is that um, it's the same convention that's used by other tools like pipm or vm, um, and it will make sure that the directory is properly ignored if you're using git and dot git ignore file and a dot git ignore file um, for your version control, um, which is really handy because we don't really want to version control this directory at all. Um, as we'll we'll see in uh, a later episode, we can create a file that has all of the packages that are installed in our environment. And then whenever we want, we can just recreate the environment from that file. And then we can version control the file. Um, so we'll talk about the details of how to do that in a, in a future episode. Okay. Um, so there is an, uh, another exercise for you to follow along with, but I'm very conscious of the time. So I'm gonna skip it and kind of leave it um, for you to, to go over as homework. Um, uh, there's some other stuff here about how to con how to configure Conda so that your prompt uh, does not contain the name of the active environment if you want to do that. Um, it's there for you to look over. I'm not going to go through it here. Um, uh, we did activating by path. Um, you can use Conda, uh, Conda to manage uh, environments for our projects, um, although given that we're a Python uh, Centric group. I'm not going to go through that exercise uh, as well. But again, like you can use Conda to manage uh, packages for other other kinds of software. Okay, um, listing Conda environments. So we've created a lot of environments. You know, how can we list what environments are available? So we can do uh, Conda environment list, and that is a command that lists all of the environments that have been created where they live, and then this star indicates the environment that's active. So currently the base environment is the active environment, which is consistent with base being here. Okay. Um, okay, so deleting environment. So we have all these environments here, so 
what happens if we, we no longer need an environment or we just want to delete it? Or we, we, I don't know, we created the environment and we don't feel like we did it right and we just want to delete it and start over. How can we do that? Well, there's a command called uh, conda. Uh, I can look at the help menu again. So in here, in the help menu, so here's a remove. Remove a list of packages from a specified conda environment. So we're going to use uh, conda remove to remove an entire uh, environment. Um, so now I've forgotten all the environments that are available. So let's look at that again. So let's remove um, the uh, Python 2.7 environment. And the dash dash all me is how you indicate that you want to remove the entire environment. So um, there would be a typo there. Uh, Python two seven EMV. Deactivate and run conda remove. Again, ah, ah, there is a typo. So what happened here? So um, I forgot to put dash dash name in front of Python 2.7 EMV. This interpreted, the command conda remove interpreted this Python 2.7 dash EMV as a package that existed in the base environment. And when it couldn't find it, it threw an error. So if we go in here and type dash dash name, it gives you a package plan. So environment location. So you can go through here and basically confirm that yes, this is what you want to do. And so we hit yes. And now we're done. And I believe now if we run conda emv list, yeah, as you can see now our environment's gone. Right, okay. And there's an exercise about deleting the basic SciPy environment that if you want to want to look at that, you can do that. Right, okay, so now we've covered, we've spent about an hour covering um, pretty much all of the basics, enough for you to um, get up and moving with, uh, with Python, or with Conda rather. So we covered how to, um, create and remove new environments using conda create, conda remove commands. We activated and deactivated using conda activate or conda deactivate. Uh, we installed packages into an existing environment using conda install. We saw an example of how to do, also do that using pip, using pip install. And we talked about the importance of making sure that you're using pip that's installed, that the importance of installing pip into every conda environment so that you can be certain that the pip that you're using with pip install is the right pip, the one that's in the environment. Um, I encourage you to install each environment as a subdirectory inside your corresponding project directory. Um, and then uh, I showed you how to use uh, conda um, emv list to list uh, environments in their locations, and then conda list is a command that you can run to list the packages installed in a current in an environment. Right. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just stop sharing, or maybe I have stopped sharing. Yes, I guess I did stop sharing. Okay. Um, just going to check the uh, the chat. And then I will uh, go back and we'll finish up the tutorial with the, the last episode that we'll have time to cover today. Um, uh, how do you export your libraries to be reused in another project when using Conda? Excellent question. We're going to talk about that in the next episode. Um, uh, Bruno has pip freeze question mark. So there is a command called conda export, which is um, very similar to pip freeze. Um, uh, 
And what PIP export is going to do is going, or sorry, not PIP export, what Conda export is going to do is going to export something called an environment file, which is the Conda equivalent of a PIP requirements.txt. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, so I'm going to start sharing again. No, I don't seem to be sharing. All right, now we're sharing again. There we go. Okay. Um, right, so now we're going to move on to sharing environment. And so we've got about 20 minutes. Um, to cover this, so it's going to be a bit speedy um, to make sure that I that I finish on time. <clears throat> but uh, this episode is about sharing environments and working with, importantly, working with environment files because the environment file is going to be the mechanism by which you will share your environments with either um, your peers, colleagues, or research collaborators, or you can think of sharing environments with yourself where if you have a local uh, laptop or workstation and then maybe you have a VM running in the cloud or you have a remote cluster, you need to share your Conda environment on one machine with yourself as a user of some other machine. And environment files are gonna be the mechanism to do this. Um, so we're gonna focus on um, uh, kind of motivating and why you would wanna share environment files how to create them and how to use them. And then I will probably wrap up today by showing you how to create a custom kernel for your Conda environment inside of Jupyter Lab so that you can launch notebooks and launch uh, Python, IPython consoles um, that are, are attached to a specific environment. Um, and we're going to see how to create environment files. OK. So um, as I said, Environment files are the mechanism through which you will share like the complete specification of a Conda environment with others or with yourself on another machine. So creating environment files um, is done by writing a, a YAML file. So uh, YAML is short for uh, YAML markup language. Um, it's a very common kind of structured text format for um, writing configuration files. Uh, it's used uh, by Docker, it's used by Kubernetes, it's used by many, many different frameworks for specifying configuration files, and <clears throat> um, Conda uh, uses it for writing environment files. Um, I always create an environment file for every um, project and every Conda environment, um, because that way I always have this file which I can version control, and I can share it with my colleagues or with myself on another machine, and I can use this file to recreate a Conda environment wherever I want. Okay. By convention, um, the environment file is called environment.yaml. Uh, you can call it whatever you want, um, but if you uh, call it something else, then you have to pass the dash dash file option to the Conda env create command, as we'll see in a minute. Um, so, all right, so let's take a look at an environment file. So here is an example of what a simple environment file would look like. It has a name, uh, machine learning in, um, has some uh, dependencies. Um, here is a dependent. So this is basically just recreating uh, using an environment file, the machine learning environment. Okay. Um, here's another example. So if you wanted to uh, create um, environment by name, you can give it a name. If you don't, if you're going to create the environment and put the environment in a different location using prefix, then, which is what I typically do, um, I just put a name of null. But environment file always has to start with a name. So if you're not going to give it a name, you can just put null. Um, and then you list the dependencies. If you want to be explicit about version numbers, then you can just list the version numbers that you want. Um, uh, as well. Right, okay, so you should always uh, version control, always version control uh, your environment.yaml file. Um, this is this is what I mentioned earlier, so you never version control the EMV directory, which could be quite big, it could have gigabytes of, soft, of software installed into that EMV directory, 
But as long as you have an environment file and you version control the environment file, then create that AMV directory whenever you want. Okay, so let's see an example of how, how we might do this. So I am going to go over to JupyterLab and I'm gonna go over here to the uh, file manager. And so inside of introduction to Conda, so this is that EMV um, environment that we created earlier. I'm gonna create a new directory. I'm gonna call it um, my project dir. And then inside my project dir, um, I am going to create a new uh, text file. And then I will uh, rename, so you can right click on the file and then tap rename. And I'm gonna call this environment.yml for environment.yml. And um, now I'm gonna go back and just copy, just copy and paste. Now notice that here on JupyterLab, so JupyterLab knows, uh, has nice syntax highlighting and things like that for YAML files. So it's done some nice kind of syntax highlighting and formatting. So we're gonna save this, <coughs> um, which you can do with like a command or a control S or just go file, save YAML file. Okay. So now I get rid of that. And so inside our introduction to Conda, we now have this my project dir. So I'm going to change directory into my project dir. And now um, I'm just going to type clear so you can get some more, uh, more real estate to work with. Um, and so now we're going to run the command to create a Conda environment from this YAML file. Um, and the command is conda env create. And now I'm going to use a, a slash to do multi line commands so that it wraps a little better. Um, prefix. So I'm going to create the environment in, in as a subdirectory within my project directory. So this is following the best practice that I am encouraging to follow. And then I, I, I don't need to pass the dash dash file because I followed the convention by um, naming the environment uh, dot yaml file environment dot yaml, but I'm just showing you how to do that, um, and then hit enter. And now, at this point, Conda is just going to be doing the exact same thing that it's been doing when we created environment uh, using the, the basic Conda create command. It's just reading all of the specifications for the packages that we want to install from the environment.yaml file, which we specified here. Right. Okay, so while this is going, I'll, I'll talk about the next little tip, um, which is beware the conda emv export command. So uh, the conda emv export command is the kind of like the pip freeze command in that it, um, it exports um, an environment file for the currently active environment. The, the only kind of but there are some caveats. So like this is a great command to use if you um, if you and your research peers or colleagues have a common operating system. So like you're all using Windows, you're all using Linux, you're all using Mac, or you um, on your laptop or workstation have the same operating system that is running on whatever remote uh, cluster or on the public cloud, uh, which is probably gonna be Linux uh, in those contexts. And I'll explain the reason for that uh, in just in a moment. Um, so now that we've created this environment, if we do conda activate emv dot slash emv to activate the environment that we just created, 
And now we were to write conda list. So it's just listing off all of the uh, the packages that we installed. Yeah, so that's just the commands that we learned before. But now we've created this environment from this dot, this environment.yaml file. If we were to run uh, conda env export, what comes back in the terminal is now actually a properly formatted um, uh, conda, file, conda environment file. So it has channels. We're not going to talk about channels today, except I'll say that channels are uh, a prioritized list of uh, URLs where conda will look to find existing packages. Um, and then our dependencies. And so, but look how specific these dependencies are. It's like not only the package name, but the version number and this thing called the build number, which we saw when we ran the conda env or the conda list command. So these are the build numbers here, this third column. Um, you can specify specific builds if you, if you want to. Um, you typically don't need to. Um, and then, and that's it. If there was stuff that had been installed via pip, it would show up as um, pip installed here in the environment.yaml file. Um, however, Included in this list will be things that are operating system specific. So if I was to take this environment.yaml file and give it to a Windows user or a Mac user, it would fail. Like Conda would fail to create an environment from this because it's too specific. It's basically pinned things. These build numbers are operating system specific and they might not, uh, or they might be operating system specific and, and it, it might fail. So it's just something to be aware of. Now you can actually um, pass the no builds option to get um, a version of the environment.yaml file that doesn't have the builds numbers. And this is better and has a, is more likely to work across operating systems, but there still might be stuff like these things, for example, which might be Linux specific that will not exist for Windows and Mac. So the conda env export command is great if you're sharing within a common operating system. It will give you exactly what was installed. But in general, it has it just has some caveats that you need to be aware of. And this is why I tend to write my environment.yaml files at the start of the project and maintain them myself rather than depend on the conda env export. Um, um, I mostly use the conda env export when I'm working with users at Calst um, where we're all using the same machine. And so the operating system is common amongst us. And in which case, if, they ha if users have problems, I will ask them to run this conda env export command so I can see exactly what, they're, what they've installed and what their version numbers and things are. Okay. Um, so there's an exercise on um, creating uh, a new environment from an environment.yaml file. And um, so you can go ahead and take a look at that, uh, that exercise. I'll stop sharing and go back and see. Usually at this point, there are a fair number of questions about um, environment.yaml file. So let's see what uh, um, what comes up. Um, I guess pip freeze will work once you have pip installed. Um, I actually am not sure if it would because I, well, Conda is aware of pip. I'm not sure that pip is aware of everything that Conda will have installed. Um, I guess we could test that. Uh, we could test that hypothesis. So if you run, if you ran the pip freeze command, um, so when. I guess I need to share my screen quickly again. So if I share my screen now, 
Um, so I ran the pip freeze command. Um, and you get back a lot, but not entirely everything. So if you compare the list of stuff that's here, at the output of pip freeze, with everything that is here, there's a lot more stuff that's here. So basically, I, it looks like what pip is able to do is it can detect things that are, um, that it can detect some stuff, but it's clearly not everything. So definitely don't rely on the pip freeze command to give you a, a complete listing of everything that's, that's there. Right, let's see what else. Um, okay. Uh, is there a more general alternative that produces OS agnostic dependencies only? So, uh, Aya, that's a great question. To my knowledge, there, um, to my knowledge, there isn't. Um, and this is why I kind of create my own environment.yaml files and just manage them myself because I often want to make sure that things are OS system agnostic or operating system agnostic. Um, and the easiest way to do that is to just maintain them yourself from the start. It's also a good practice because it just gets you off headed in that direction of using environment.yaml file. Um, okay. And it looks like we're not quite going to have time to do. Uh, I'll show you. Well, no. I think rather than rush through some more uh, hands on examples, I'll just talk you through uh, the last part of this. Um, uh, the last part of, of this episode. Um, OK, so updating an environment. So. You can update an environment um, using an environment.yaml file. Um, but the way that I, uh, I, there's two ways to do it, and one of which is the, is the way that I, I tend to do it, which is rebuilding a Conda environment from scratch. So you could run this Conda EMV update command, which has the same structure as the Conda EMV create command. So if you go in and you edit your environment.yaml file, remove some dependencies, add some dependencies, change version numbers, whatever, save the file, and then run this update command, it will recreate the environment and just change whatever is required that has been changed from the environment file. So it will add dependencies that didn't previously exist. Um, if you add the dash dash prune option, it will remove stuff that's no longer needed. Um, I tend to rebuild from scratch, which takes a little bit longer, but we're talking like generally order of a couple of minutes longer um, than just running the update command. And I do this because then I only have to remember one command, conda env create dash dash prefix dot slash env. If you always put your environments in the same place, then you can always use this dot slash env to put the environment in the exact same place for every project. Um, the same environment.yaml naming convention, so you don't have to remember anything but environment.yaml. And this dash dash force, and the force just basically blows away whatever environment directory was there previously and just rebuilds the whole thing from scratch. 